All right, we're going to be taking a look at this lab, two-factor authentication, broken logic. This is a very difficult lab to solve with Burp Community Edition. It's fairly trivial to solve this lab with the professional edition of Burp. This is going to be the guide on how you might go about solving this lab if you only have access to the Community Edition. And we'll also discuss why it's difficult to solve this lab with the Community Edition. Now this lab is based around a vulnerability in two-factor authentication. The easiest way to understand this is simply to have a look at what the lab's doing. So without further ado, let's fire up the lab. The best starting point here is just to go through some authentication flow. We do have a valid set of credentials, Wiener, Peter. We can click login. We then get asked for our four digit security code. So this is the two-factor authentication aspect of this lab, at which point we typically check our emails. This is a mock email client, and you can see we have the code 0680. Let's type in our two-factor authentication code 0680. Let's choose login. We've now accessed the account section. In terms of requests sent to the back end, there is first of all a get request to access the login page to forward slash login. We then submit a post request to the same endpoint. That's going to be providing our username and password. We can see Wiener and Peter there in the request body. We then submit a get request to forward slash login to. This is the form that's requesting the two factor authentication four digit code. And you can see as part of that, we have a value specified in the cookie verify equals wiener we'll come back to that shortly once we have our two-factor authentication code we then submit a post request to the forward slash login to endpoint we can see that the four digit code is passed as part of the post request body once again we have this value verify equals wiener as part of the cookie parameter now when we think about that get forward slash login to endpoint it's logical to assume that we should only be able to access forward slash login to endpoint if we've already provided our username and password. That's the flow of this, right? We provide username, password, then we get access to the form where we can submit our two-factor authentication. Just to show you why this is potentially vulnerable right out of the gate, we go to log out here. So we don't have any authenticated session at this stage. Let's simply submit a get request to forward slash login to. We haven't provided any credentials at this stage. We haven't started that process of the two-factor authentication, yet we can simply access the please enter your four digit security code form. It doesn't require a lot of tech knowledge to understand that we probably shouldn't be able to access the second stage of two-factor authentication if we haven't successfully bypassed the first stage of two-factor authentication. Now, although this is a bit strange, it's not a definite vulnerability at this stage. So long as the app just completely disregards any input we provide to this form because we're not legitimately at the second stage of two-factor authentication, of course, this is a vulnerable lab. That's not how it's going to work. Now, it's not as if we can just enter the two-factor authentication code for our target, Carlos, here. And part of the reason is the app is not listening for Carlos's two-factor authentication code. There is not a code that's been generated or associated with Carlos's account. It turns out that the get request to forward slash login to is what puts the app into listening mode for that two-factor authentication code with that second cookie parameter verify equals wiener. So if we send that to the repeater and change this to the value of Carlos, the app is now in listening mode or it's generated a two-factor authentication token for Carlos, which really doesn't make sense given that we haven't so far provided Carlos's username and password for the first stage of the two-factor authentication. Now, if we head back to the next stage of the authentication process, which is the post request to log into, let's send that to the repeater. We can once again change verify to Carlos, and it turns out that the app has generated a code for Carlos, and it's actually listening for the two-factor authentication code for Carlos. We can see the current code in the request body, 0680. Now, that was was the code for Wiener. It's probably not going to work for Carlos. It's not impossible, but it would be pretty lucky if it did work. Having said that, we are able to submit an attempt at providing the two-factor authentication code, which we wouldn't imagine we should be able to do either. Just take a look at the render of the output here. Incorrect security code. In other words, the app actually just went and checked. It just went and checked whether this was the valid four-digit security code for Carlos. Carlos didn't even complete the first stage of the two-factor authentication code, but the app has no problem checking to see if 
our four digit security code matches with the one that's been generated for Carlos. Now that doesn't give us access at this stage because we still have this issue of the four digit two factor authentication code, which we legitimately don't know at this stage. Now it's at this stage, if you have the pro edition of Burp, you're almost done with the lab because all you really need to do at this stage is send this to Intruder, head to the Intruder tab, add some payload markers around the MFA code. In fact, Burp seems to do that automatically since it's the only parameter in the post request body. And we can brute force all of the possible four digit pins. Now, a little bit of quick maths reveals that there should be about 10,000 because remember we also have the pin 0000 all the way through 9999 and it would be possible just to head to the payloads tab and brute force 0000 all the way to 9999. Great with the pro edition you can get that done probably in less than a minute. Burp is very fast community edition, that's going to take a very long time because of the throttling with the community edition. I don't know exactly how long it will take, but let's just say to get through even a hundred pins seems to be upwards of 10 minutes after the throttling as a rough guess. I'm going to guess to get through 10,000. We're talking about days of work here, depending on how diligent you are at rerunning. The likelihood is that even if you were very committed to spending the next two, three days of your life rerunning an intruder attack for different MFA ranges, at some point you're going to accidentally time out. I mean, I'm going to guess you might need to sleep at some point probably going to time out from the lab. Now, as it happens, I did actually manage to solve this using Intruder with the community edition of Burp. And that's mostly because I got lucky. I started with the pin 1000 and the pin ended up being something like 1046. So I actually solved this lab very quickly, but it does seem that there are a range of possible pins. It's not confined to something in the 1000 region necessarily. I mean, for example, here, Wiener's authentication code was 0680. So that's actually less than a thousand. So it could, potentially be any number from four zeros to four nines. We're going to need a different way of brute forcing this, which doesn't make use of Burp Suite Community Edition. Now it is of course possible to make use of something like Zap Proxy. I'm not going to do that. I think it's probably not great taste given this is Portsvigger Web Security Academy. So we're going to solve this in a slightly different way. First of all, let's grab our endpoint. So we know we're going to be posting to forward slash login to, and of course we have a unique lab ID that's going to change based on the lab. Now, generally speaking, HTTP requests are very fast and we don't need port swigger in order to make HTTP requests. In fact, we can make HTTP requests with Python, HTTP requests with Node.js. We can also make HTTP requests simply using curl command line interface. And we could actually use that as part of a bash script as well. So we can use curl inside a bash script. And that's exactly what I've created here as my solution. So I have this script brute.sh. Let's just vim into that. It's really not too complicated. Let's just take a quick look at what it does and feel free just to copy the information from this script. Now I've defined a couple of variables. First of all, the endpoint, we're going to need to paste in the current endpoint of our current lab. We then have the value that's passed to the cookie. So we have session equals one, two, three. It turns out that the session value is not important. So we'll just leave that as one, two, three. The important part here is verify equals Carlos since we're indicating to the lab that we are providing the two-factor authentication code for Carlos. We then have a for loop in bash really works in a similar way to many other languages. So we have four IDX that's going to be our iterator in, then we can provide a numbers range zero to nine, 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 nine. Now, one of the issues with the range at the moment is if you have zero to nine, 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 it means the first value is going to be zero. The second value is going to be one. It's not going to be zero, 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 which is what we want and zero, 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 one. So we're actually going to turn that into a string. Now for a for loop in bash, you have do and then done. So do indicates the beginning of the loop done indicates the end of the loop. So we type do, then we're going to assign a string to a new variable MFA that stands for multi-factor authentication. And we're going to assign a string based on the output of print F. So this is for manipulating strings and the string is going to be MFA code. So this is actually the body of the post request that we're going to add shortly. MFA code equals, we then have a little bit of bash wizardry. This is to format a number always having four digits. 
So we have percent zero four D backslash N, then we provide our iterator. But because we provided that four digit format, IDX is always going to be four digits. So zero is going to be zero, 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 et cetera, then zero, 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 one. So all we've done is include that as part of a string MFA code equals followed by a four digit pin from zero, 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 zero to nine, 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 nine. We then start our curl request curl. We use our endpoint variable, which is going to add shortly O, which is going to send the output to forward slash dev null. In other words, we don't want to see the HTML for all of these requests. It's just going to get crazy. And we then have silent mode with hyphen S. The backslash just allows us to use our command across several lines inside the script. So we then have W for write. Now this is very useful. We can actually output a string making use of variables such as HTTP code. So we're going to have a string HTTP code. It's then going to mention the HTTP code as part of the output string because we're looking for a 302 HTTP response. We're then going to just echo the MFA that was used so that when we do get the 302 response, we know exactly which MFA value is used to solve the lab. We then have dash B that's going to be our cookie, which is going to be the value of the variable session equals one, two, three, verify equals Carlos. We then have data and we're just going to pass the value of that MFA string to the data. Curl knows it's a post request because it has a body, whereas a get request wouldn't have that. Now at the moment, this is going to run one request at a time. There is a way of speeding this up. I'm not going to worry about that just yet. I will show you the faster version of this, but it is a little bit more stable just to run one request at a time. So let's just run brute.sh. Let's get a feel for the output here. So you can see the output, we get the HTTP code, and then we get the used MFA value. And it's really just a case of watching the output of this script until we get the HTTP code 302 response, and then having a look at the corresponding MFA code. Now I've deliberately run the script this way just to be a bit dramatic so you can see it functioning, but really what we would normally do here is we would pipe the output to a grep search function. In other words, rather than having all of this HTTP code 200, we don't care about that because those are invalid pins. We would actually run the script, then we would grep the output for HTTP code 302, which would be less exciting. We'd basically just have a blank terminal until all of a sudden there's a 302 response from the app and then we get on the screen HTTP code 302 followed by the MFA code that actually generated that 302 response. All right, so I stopped the script there. You can see 0626, so fairly fast in this case, we get the HTTP code 302. Now, one of the things I did have to do is just go back and actually paste in the correct endpoint variable because I forgot to change that, restarted the script. But you can see we have a 302 response. Basically, we know the pin at this stage, it's 0626. So here is our post request to forward slash login two. We can now change that MFA code to 0626. Let's now click send and you can see we get the 302 found response. Now, how do we actually solve the lab? We can't just render this here because it's actually a redirect. Now, if I right click on the response, I can choose this option request in browser and we get two options here in original session and in current browser session. What we actually want to do is choose in original session for this. We get a link. We can just copy and paste that into our browser. So I pasted the link. I click enter. It follows that 302 redirect and we get congratulations, you solved the lab. If you choose in current browser session, unfortunately it's not going to work. So it's very important you choose the right option there from Burp in original session. Now, if you have seen this lab solved with the professional edition of Burp, you'll probably know that it's quite a bit faster. I mean, this is fairly fast, what we've looked at. It's definitely a lot better than the throttled community edition of Burp, which would take forever. Even at the rate that we've seen, you could definitely get through all 10,000 within probably less than 10 minutes. So it's definitely very doable, but Burp Professional is even faster. So what's going on here? What we're seeing here at the moment are consecutive requests. In other words, the HTTP request is sent off a response is waited for, then when the response is received, then the string is echoed to the console, and then the next request is generated. The way that tools like Burp operate even faster than this is by making concurrent or parallel requests. I guess we could also use the term asynchronous rather than synchronous. So at the moment, the script is synchronous, one request after the other, but to be really fast, we want asynchronous. Now this can be a little bit less stable. How would we actually do that in Bash? Well, let's have a bit of fun. Let's see if we can still solve the lab by making parallel requests. So we're going to head into our document, which is brute.sh. 
And one of the things that we can do in Bash is at the end of our curl request, we can simply make use of the ampersand sign. And this allows us to move immediately onto the next request while this request is still processing. Now there's probably more elegant ways of doing this where we control the number of threads, because as you can imagine at this current stage, this could get out of control very, very quickly. But just to illustrate the difference between parallel and synchronous requests, let's run this script. You will notice that it is a lot faster. I have a feeling we might crash the lab though, or get kicked out or whatever it is. Now let's just run brute.sh again. So very, very fast. I think this is probably comparable to the speed of Burt Professional Edition. Unfortunately, you can see stream failed to close correctly. This is the error I got before, just slightly too many requests. So I guess a couple of takeaways here, we shouldn't really be able to access the second stage of an authentication process without having completed the first step. Fairly logical, not always so obvious when you're in the flow of designing a web app is something that could be overlooked. I guess we could also argue that four digit security code is going to be less secure than something like a six digit security code. As we saw, it was fairly easy to brute force the security code and there was also no throttling in place. In other words, if we input an incorrect security token three or four times in a row, we should probably be locked out from continuing to do that. Whereas we were able to just submit 10,000 requests with different two-factor authentication codes in a very short space of time. So not only was the two-factor authentication logic broken, but we also had a brute forcible four-digit security code and no protection in place against brute forcing. All right, hopefully you enjoyed the lab. Hopefully you were able to solve this lab with the community edition of Burp. Thanks very much for watching. Catch you guys in the next lab.